Thank you, Mr. Padma. Yes. Respected Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Arya Sambhasiv Rao, sir. Honorable Madam Natali Salving Mikhalo, Professor and Head in the University of uh, Westminster International University in Tashkent. My former head, Professor L.S. Sarma, sir, Dr. Moya, Mr. Suraj, and dear participants. It's great pleasure for me to welcome such a great dignity uh, who is known in the world for the uh, class culture management. Madam Natali Salving Mikhalo is head of the Department of Management in Westminster International University in Tashkent, which is a first international university in Asia. And uh, this is a very high ranked university in the QS rank. Madam, I have experience of more than nine countries. She started studying in the US. She did her MBA from the Golden State University, San Francisco and did her PhD in the University of Turku, Finland. And uh, after uh, completing her education, she did the job in the University of New York, Prague, University of Turku, Finland, and uh, Suleiman Shah University, <coughs> Turkey, and so many other universities. So we feel very proud to welcome such a dignity for the international webinar uh, in our university. And uh, Madam is also co-country investigator of the Uzbekistan for the project Blue. So Madam, on the, this occasion of international webinar on the uh, international uh, uh, culture, business culture management, I welcome you uh, for this webinar. Taking this opportunity, my sincere welcome to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Arya Sambhasiv Rao, sir, who has provided this opportunity and uh, uh, that platform on which we can connect so many per international personalities. Professor K. Arya Sambha Sivrao uh, is a well-known scientist and philosopher. He has the DSc and PhD in three degrees, and uh, he has master degree in more than five sub subjects. His uh, citation is more than uh, 12,000 and he published more than 300 papers in the international and national journals. Besides this, uh, his academic leadership, uh, and he is so kind-hearted that he very easily we can uh, take any kind of opportunity in our university. So I welcome such a great personality on this uh, occasion of the international webinar. I would also like to welcome our former head professor, L.S. Sarma, he always support us and uh, he, he never hesitate to provide any kind of help. I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. K. Lalram Moya, Assistant Professor, Department of Management, and he is in charge of the NIAC uh, Department of Management, and he is also uh, this uh, in charge of the marketing division, marketing cell of the management department. I would like to welcome all the participants faculty member from the department, faculty member from the university, and uh, Mr. Suraj, who is providing all the technical support for organizing such kind of webinar. Without uh, taking too much time, I would like to request uh, Madam to deliver the lecture, but before that I can request the participants to give their questions and answer in the question section, uh, question and answer section. And uh, Professor Sarma will handle the question and answer session. Now, my humble request to Honorable Madam Natali Salving Mikhalo to deliver her speech. Ma'am, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Sin. It was a great pleasure and honor to be invited. And thank you for your introduction. I'm not sure I'm so well known as you say, but it's nice to hear that. Um, I'm just going to give another kind of brief summary as Dr. Sin said, my name is Natalie Salvei Mikhailov and I'm ethnic Finn who is also 
a U.S. citizen. I was born in the former Soviet Union, and I lived in Finland, Czech Republic. In addition, I lived in Latin countries, Ecuador, Colombia, and now I'm in Tashkent, and I've been to Turkey as another Asian country. So as you can see, I'm basically uniquely placed to be a cross-cultural person. So I was basically born cross-cultural, and cross-cultural management is my area of research and teaching. And the topic of this lecture, as you can see, Europe and looking at cultural dimension, culture and business. And why Europe? I think Europe is a rather small continent, a rather small part of the world. And quite often people from other parts of the world assume that Europe is basically more or less culturally uniform. Just as United States or Russia, also big countries, Europe of course not a country, but nevertheless Europe is smaller than the United States and Russia, they are more or less culturally uniform. And indeed European culture is distinct and quite different from most other cultures of the world. As Wayne said, most cultures are not weird, meaning abbreviation Western, industrialized, educated, rich, and democratic. And Europe, as well as Anglo-Saxonian sphere of influence, US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all in this category. Yet Europe is different from Anglo-Saxon cultures. And that's why today I'm not going to be focused on UK. I assume that all of your participants fluent in is as you are fluent in English, uh, more exposed to the UK culture. Yet European cultures are different and they influence not only the way you do business, but also the institutions, the families, the business approaches. So I'm going to talk to you about different business cultures and what first, what is culture, as quite often people talk about culture and they assume it to be more of the traditions, kind of business etiquette, taboos, the way you shake hands, do you kiss, do you don't kiss, do you eat with your hands, with your fork, with chopsticks and other things. Yet culture is an underlying a kind of system that helps us to understand what business is about, how we do business, what's important and not. And I assume since you are probably mostly business students, some of the things would be well known to you. But just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about, I'm going to start with very basic introduction and then get into details and I would be happy to answer your questions after the discussion. So at the very basic thing and okay, culture, what is culture? And I'm putting the quotation that is well known, well quoted from Geert Hofstadt, the father of the cross-cultural management as one of the authorities said, it's easier to cross the desert uh, without stepping on a sand than to talk about culture without mentioning Geert Hofstadt. Sadly, he left us this year, but he was the pioneer and the one who talked about culture in the business sense. Culture is a collective programming of the mind. Uh, oops, I get Ah, sorry, I can that distinguish the members of one category from another. As you notice, he does not talk really about nation culture. Also, his research is focused on nations, and there is some critique on that. But cultures can be distinct in nation, ethnic group, gender groups, if genders are quite different, which again, based on the national and ethnic culture, organization, family, anybody who had the underlying programming. And um, that's, as I said, well known and often quoted citation, but not everybody really think of that. And I would like you just to think you have computers, computers have hardware. Hardware 
allows the capability, but the way you work on that, what program you run, that is basically the same as the culture in the society. People really don't have culture. When I say it to my students, they sometimes become very confused and say, what do you mean we don't have culture? Like you don't have cultures as a person. You have culture as a society. You belong to a culture, you share culture. The other misunderstanding that I often heard that people assume that culture is something almost static, almost the weather. Well, I live in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has climate. It's rather hot in Uzbekistan right now. And Uzbekistan has culture, which is very collectivistic, for example. So people like their families spend a lot of time with it. And it's assumed that everybody who is in Uzbekistan shares this culture. It is not true. In order to share culture, a person has to be socialized and the quite common way is basically bringing a child in the culture, but the person joining culture later can be socialized in the culture. For example, I arrived to the United States as an adult, but since my personal values were very much in line with U.S. values, uh, going to school, to the university, as Dr. Sin said, working there, very fast I become socialized in the American culture. So I value hard work, I value individualism, I value giving back to the community, but less so being collectivistic. So let's continue with that. Um, and um, also I would like to talk about different markets. I wouldn't get in deep into the market, so those of you who came for culture don't get upset thinking, oh my God, now we are going to talk about markets. But that's why uh, that Europe is very unique, uh, actually, cultural thing. It's, as I said, it's a small part of the world. And it has very many countries, 27 in the Union and more so in Europe. And they all have quite distinct cultures. They don't share one European culture. They do share European laws. They do share European common market, but cultures are very distinct. And sometimes when you go to a kind of homogeneous cultures, for example, in the Czech Republic, people will tell you, oh, well, people in the West, in Bohemia, really, really quite different from people from the East, Moravia. They eat different things. They look differently. They almost speak different languages. It's surprisingly, they don't, they understand each other. Um, and you kind of know, but say, yes, I see. But for foreigners, Bohemians and Moravians look pretty much the same. And the foreigner does not hear the difference in languages. So just pretty much homogeneous culture. Um, the same, actually, Finns would say, people from the West and people from the East, very, very different again. For a foreigner, Finns pretty much look the same, sound the same, eat the same things, and are not really different from one another. Obviously, all people are different, people from different groups, but cultures of Finland, of Czech Republic are quite distinct and quite homogeneous. Now, Czechs and Finns are very different. They have very different values. Their societies are different. Their family structures different. Although they're still families, father, mother, children, but the roles of the family is different. So just to give you an example, I'm going to show you, well, I'm showing you now, that's different market system. Anglo-Saxonian model that most people associate with Europe and United States, and again, it's quite different, is very, free, individualistic, private ownership, free enterprise, minimum social sa safety net, which is not common for the rest of Europe, flexible employment practices. So employment is at will, and it's assumed that individuals can take care of themselves, and the best society can do is just leave them alone. Then there are social market economy model. They are private ownership, but social partners include employer group, union, banks, they work closely together to ensure that the rules and regulation and the work 
union and corporations of both involved in government and they work together and employment practices are rather inflexible there is rather strong safety net it's very difficult to fire a person and if a person loses employment they have a lot of safety and there is nordic model i live in another country as i am very sad and annoyed to hear that there is socialism in nordic it shares by all people who live in nordic it's like we don't have socialism we have social welfare society it's capitalism there is no social there some enterprises are owned but very few and they're mostly enterprises like transportation that's all of uh gas something that's monopolic in any country so there is high taxes and there are some market regulations but not much and very strong social safety net as they say people are taking care in such societies from cradle to grave uh, so there are different systems and they're based on cultural values what people value in the society basically dictates what kind of economic system they choose to have so just a bit overview i'm sure you all know that it's i'm sorry it's in spanish i think it's in spanish my map but just european union i will be focusing on union so i am not going to talk much about balkans but there are 27 countries now 5 million 500 million people the currency is euro although not all countries have that the laws and regulations are harmonized their price transparency and there used to be no customs and no borders but as you all know COVID-19 has changed a lot, so there are some borders reinstated, but for safety reasons. So you can see Europe is not that large considering, but it's a very distinct place. And uh, the cross-cultural management scale, I find it fascinating because neighbors are quite often, have quite different cultures, and it gives us an understanding what might influence their culture. Okay. So again, looking back what culture is and at what isn't. So it's a learned behavior and it's shared and transmitted by members of particular society. So people are not born with cultures, they're born into cultures. What culture is, is solution to the problems. All societies have the same problems. Well, normally when I ask my students what problems societies have, they depending on the country, you might say corruption, nepotism, poverty, this, that. But actually, all society have basic problems, which is how to bring up children, how to feed members of the society, how to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. And all solutions are present in all societies. So you can do different things you can all societies normally have different um, approaches so for example if we look at bringing up children in all societies there are different ways so some children are orphans they're brought in the orphanages some children are adopted by strangers or by members of the family but the preferred solution might be bringing up children by their parents or bringing up children by their grandparents or for example in Nordic model which is quite distinct and being a Finn myself and being educated there I kind of find it's very unusual still because it's not shared by the rest of the world the idea is that state should take care of the children so for example all children are required to go to the kindergarten either they need it or not all children have to go to state schools there are no private schools there are no homeschooling so basically states take care of all the children parents are encouraged obviously to take care of children as well and they're given money and maybe some of you heard in finland famous baby boxes 
when all new parents, no matter if they're Finnish citizen or visitors, just as long as the baby was born in Finland, get a little box. And traditionally, they put everything in the box that the baby might need. And, you know, diapers, bottles, toys. And ideally, the box, they said, well, and if you don't have a bed, the baby can sleep in the box. So that was the idea of the box. Of course, nowadays, things that they find in the box are different. And I don't think any babies are sleeping in the boxes, but it's still there. And so all the societies have the same solutions available, but they're different preferences. And culture is not a characteristic of individuals. So people don't have cultures, they can share cultures. It's a set of belief and people can change their cultures. They might think that other cultures, other values is more consistent with their personal beliefs. So it's again, it's not something that people are born being Italian by culture or Finns or Czechs or French. They become that by socializing and an Italian can go to German and actually have a set of German values. And that's a bit a different topic. Unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to discuss it that much, but multicultural and transcultural individuals are somebody who easily move between cultures. I think I'm one of those people. So can understand and share values of different society and kind of work with the societies. So basically what I already told you. Uh, let me just make sure that I don't see that. Okay. So all the solutions are available in all society, but they're different preferences. So in one society, there is idea that it's best if children are brought by mothers. In other societies, grandmothers are the best. In other societies, state is important. Or if you can think that all societies have somehow people select their partners. Normally, it's marriage partners. But in one society, you will give preference to individuals and they decide. In other societies, parents have a lot of say. And let's third society, you go to the professionals and have matchmakers. And of course, it doesn't say that it's never happened, but there are different preferences. Cultural rules feel natural, and other solutions, they're strange. So quite often, people will assume that their culture is universal. So for example, when I work in Czech Republic, where mothers normally speak spend most time with their children everybody said but it's natural for mother to take care of their children of course it's mother's job not fathers not grandmothers not a hired nanny um, but just as natural for a Finn, for example would be say but of course children should be so socialized in the society of course they have to go to kindergarten so they learn to be a good citizen so that's the basic thing okay is it working? and I'm sure many of you have seen that that's manifested culture is just the tip of the iceberg and sometimes people express their values so that was the example of values expressed it's natural for mothers to take care of the children or but basic assumption is something that people rarely view because they're basic and they assume to be universal so that's different ways of iceberg culture or onion culture. And then if we look at the layers of the culture, they are behavior on explicit level. So just think if you get to another country, you will notice people dress differently, people talk differently, louder, softer, people use different expressions. Even now that we basically all wear the same clothes, you will see the difference and the norms and rules that might be expressed in this state or might not and basic assumptions are difficult to describe because they're basic because that's the assumption that we were given in childhood as the only normal and natural way to do and again that's just talking again about culture 
in more details that if we look the bigger in the culture iceberg you can see language and again in Europe there are many languages it's a lot of languages and there is no one uniform language even though English is the language of business that's and most people in Europe speak languages they are not one uniform language and most people in Europe speak several languages so for example in Finland there are three in the there's three state languages English is not one of them it's Finnish Swedish and Sami language Sami language is a genius people language and basically there is a out less than a thousand people who speak Sami as the first language yet it is a state language although a lot of documents are in English and more than 10 percent of the population of Finland speak Russian as their first language yet Russian is not one of the state languages and you can say that's the same thing in France people know France French and English and maybe Spanish so most people in Europe speak several languages quite traditionally but there is strong preference for their national language and protection of their national language which you don't see in many other countries for example in the Czech Republic there is a special committee that makes sure that people talking on TV or in any other official capacity do not use words like marketing computer and so on they have to use Czech equivalent and they have to speak gra grammatically correct Czech so language pays a lot of importance and in most countries people say you cannot really be not only belong to us but you cannot be a resident until you speak good enough local language I myself speak six languages very badly but I would I passed Czech language to be a resident and Finnish was my first language uh, although not for a long time being born in Soviet Union but nevertheless language is very important and they're quite different their Slavic language Roman language finishes in a group in a, of its own then everyday behavior what people do how they celebrate holidays what they eat how they live how they dress what are the medicine management and hygiene and so on this is the thing that people normally talk about as culture so like curious fact in Finland they are basically half there's a, half as many saunas as people so for two people there is one sauna it's because there are saunas in most apartments it's because there is a lot of saunas in country houses and in addition in gyms universities so hygiene is very important it's not because people are so dirty that they need to take sauna by the way it's not sauna as pronounced in English it's sauna it's the only word that comes to international language from Finnish and I think it's good if we all pronounce it correctly not sauna but sauna so there is very important actually cultural mechanism people do everything in sauna it's very strange but they celebrate holidays there it used to be that business meetings would take place there a lot of young adults have memories of sauna when because that's how they start their weekend before they go you know whatever young adults do clubbing partying they would go to sauna that so that's very important everyday's behavior but they are based on institution values social norms so know how that's communication codes artifacts things that are created institution as I told you the way we have the same institution family education business but what are their goals what are the points of having its institutions are very different so families exist in every society but what is the role of the family is it the role to develop individuals to bring up children 
promote riches in Europe, even though it's distinct in cultures, different countries, as I said, and you will see them more distinct as you go from south to north and from east to west. The, mostly the idea of family is provide support to each other, to be friends, and children are brought to be independent members of the society. Why in the rest of the world, children are told to be respectful, to become members of the community as a part of the community. The individualism, independence, creative thinking are stressed in the family. So when child is ready to leave the family, it means that family being successful. The sooner it happens, the more successful is the family. Social norms, that's where we go, kiss, don't kiss, shake hands, you know, come on time, be 15 minutes late, but they're based on values. So do you value other times? Do you express empathy or keep your distance? Is it important to show reference to kind of reference to higher ranking members or not? And then if we go deeper, you really need to go into the science and sometimes we need to look at myths, fairy tales, beliefs. So what is the nature or of the people, of animals? And we have to look at fairy tales and maybe songs and other kind of classic non, non-written materials. So that's just something that I would probably remind you. And so we end up to have a cultural frame, shared beliefs, what it is, what can it be, how to feel. And quite often you might think, well, well what it is, it's, it's quite clear what it is, but not so. Quite often the same behavior based on quite different reasons. It's kind of funny thing that I can share with you, where it's not about Europe, but connected. That's when I first came to Latin America, uh, not first to Latin America, to to Colombia. I was teaching in university and my students were carrying around like plastic boxes. And I did not see so well what was in plastic boxes. But for me, the plastic boxes look like the place you will put your pet in, like a hamster or a pet rat. And I thought at first, oh, well, they're probably some kind of bring your pet to school day and did not look closely, but uh, uh, the... me, yes. I just want to interrupt something. Uh, there is some sound coming uh, from your background, or like it may be uh, your mic may be loose. So, can you no. please? Yeah, yeah, your mic uh, it might be a little bit loose. Uh, can you just make uh, some adjustment? Okay, I will try. No, no, it, uh, it, it is coming. Uh, I think it is uh, it is okay now, madam. It is okay. Okay. Is there is no sound in the background, but no, I will... no, no. It it, it is started again. Please, uh, the I think the first one is better. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's some sound. Uh, uh, it's okay, madam. Some little bit uh, humming sound is there, but uh, it is okay. Give me just a sec. Uh, otherwise, madam, it, it, it's okay. Uh, otherwise, it's okay. It's, it's not that distracting. It's a little bit of humming sound. Okay. Uh, it Sorry, is okay. I try to do what I can, but... Uh, uh, I, it is okay, madam. You can continue, madam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, as I said, that people can switch their frames, and there are different sources of culture that you can see. that language, nationality, education, a lot of things, not only the way people were born and brought up. And there are institutions that people are organized on. So, for example, reproduction, neighbor, territorial with neighborhood, physiological, maybe interest and goals, spontaneous, exercise, expertise, hierarchy, and other things. So people get organized in different ways.
madam, we cannot hear you now. Okay, oh, it's it, it, it is fine. It is fine. We can hear you now, madam. Okay. Well, let me just make sure. I'm... This is okay. Yeah, this is fine, madam. Okay. Please continue. Thank you so much. So, <coughs> how physical environment influence that? Well, there is a lot of discussion. It seems to be that you know groups that live in the close proximity of others, for example, in the ocean. They tend to be more open, more kind of open to other cultures. And, well, I can almost quite often, I, I was telling my students, uh, what happens if you live in, say, Latin America and home cul culture in India? If somebody comes to your door and say, I'm hungry, I have no place to stay the night. Well, nothing will happen. You will tell them, go away and... They will find probably some food because there is food in the environment and nothing will happen if they stay the night in the open. It's not comfortable, but it's not life-threatening. If a cold climate, you know, we are thinking like middle of the Europe, you do the same. Well, what you would have is a dead body on your door because a person cannot stay outside in winter and there is no food in the environment. So that's why laws and cultures require people to share things. For example, in Finland, there is a rule that anybody can camp in your garden and there is cultural value of not closing the door, even when you leave. It's not because people are so much trusty, but because, who knows, maybe somebody needs to come in from the cold and the question of, of life and death. And People do believe in that, and for example, in the school where I studied, there was an open, you know, cloakroom. People just put their rather expensive coats there and left. And when I ask my classmates, aren't you worried? You know, people might take your coat and it's cost some money. They said, if they took my coat, they need it. I would rather people took my coat than go cold. And that is quite different. It's not altruism. It's not really yeah, trust in others, but you never know when you would need a code. And that's why you keep your door open because it might be that in a different situation, you will try to get into another house. And if you are not able to, you will die of exposure. So physical environment, I think, influence greatly the nations and the history again it's very important how the historically people were for example can look at the Czech Republic it's a country that's in the middle of the Europe and it's been invaded for as long as it's existed but nevertheless it was not ruined in contrast say to Poland its capital stands like because Czechs by their culture are very accommodating people. They are very easygoing, and if the army comes to them, they normally don't mind. They don't really fight. That's why they have Prague standing in contrast to Poland, which is a big country, and normally, based on its nature, was rather aggressive. And that's why Warsaw been destroyed twice just in the last century. So it's really interesting the history of the nations and physical environment, but we really cannot say how many, in which ways and how. There are just some things to consider. On the other hand, it might be the reverse conditions. There's people that had the values that allowed them to live in different environments. So, for example, less sharing uh, culture would not survive in Finland and such severe environment so this is a question like uh, you know chicken and the egg what comes first but definitely that institution like religion education and other things contribute to differences in culture so going more precisely into categories looking at different than traditional society where religion plays an important role arab countries are an example 
but you can say Europe, Greece and Balkans would fall there. The rational society like Germany, where everything based on science and the interest of individuals come first. Um, in the ex-communist society, like former Soviet Union, people are very materialistic because in the past they were denied these things. And postmodern society, which is Scandinavian Nordic society, they would be the excuse me, they're rich and they're tolerant and democratic, even though their values might not run to all the things that they allow in the society, but they tolerate them and make decisions based on the will of the most people. It's for me as a researcher, it's quite interesting to see the different responses to the COVID-19 crisis, how different societies based on their cultures choose different responses. So for example, you probably noticed that Sweden stayed open and decided not to do anything because that was the will of the people. And they said that, well, people would take care of themselves and they decide we are not going to tell them, you know, what to do. Or in rational society, Germany, there was a lot of testing and continuous testing and then separation of the people who were tested positively or have antibodies. So that was a lot of stress on that. That's very much scientific. And well, and if you take Belarus as an example, materialistic, although I'm not, it's not in the EU, there they decided like, well, it doesn't exist, let's carry on, let's go and play hockey. And again, that, strangely enough, even this was the same problem, solutions were different, and outcome pretty much the same as well. So it did not matter what the route was taken, basically the outcome was pretty much the same. Um, some of the things that's how close culture is, as you can say, Finland and Norway are very coherent. So most people are from the same ethnic background, from the same religion, speak the same language, even though they're three different languages, and they share the same language. Why Spain is not so much more diverse, and you can see different countries, the more coherent they are, the more likely the norms will be consistent and uniform. And, well, we were talking about culture in general, but the question might be, so why it's important in organizations? Isn't it the management scientific? Isn't it everybody do the same performance evaluation? But investigation long time ago, before, right at the time of Hofstad, so shown that the idea of cultural values also influenced the beliefs of the organization. So Lawrence had done a research, and that's just one answer, that the manager should have all the answers. And you see in Sweden only 10% agree with that. Why? in Japan 78, but if we go to Italy, it's 66. So there is a big difference. What is the role of managers and what is the best approach to being a manager in different country in Europe? And that's, I just wanted to show you some culture clusters that's a universal, but as you can see that Europe, yes, it's kind of pretty much together, but say Eastern Europe away and it's in Latin America, kind of in between, between Latin Europe and Eastern Europe. And I can say that even though it's it's based on house, the one that I participate in research right now, I could see that in Latin America, a lot of values were very close to Eastern Europe. So it's really helped me know that. Okay, and this is just an example of different countries, which I'm not going to read to you, but different clusters, so later on you can review and see where you would belong and so where, what is close and what not so close. So in Europe, as I said, they're Latin, Nordic, Germanic and Eastern Europe, and they're distinct clusters, and in these clusters they're distinct cultures. Um, okay, let, okay, well, let me go then, I would like to show something else. And the difference 
basis of cultural diversity and cultural is and centrality of decision making. Who is making the decision? Is it the people who do that? Is it the CEO? Is it the group? What reward and competition? Who are rewarded? The group or the individual? Do you enforce a kind of encourage competition or try to encourage cooperation? How much risk you would like to take? How much formality? For example, as you probably know, Spanish language is a very formal language. And even children call their parents senor, senora, and use kind of usted, which is polite form and address. In contrast, in Finnish, which is unusual language, uh, polite form as address is very, very rarely used. As they say, it's for president. Only the president is called, which would be in Spanish, Usted, uh, but also soldiers. That's, I think, very unusual that soldiers are given the same respect and recognition as the president of the country. And again, going back to the history, Finland owes its existence to the soldiers and because they protected Finland and Finland is the only country that stood up to both Russia, Soviet Union at the time, and Germany, and maintaining independence. So soldiers are greatly respected, and that's why they're called the same way as the president. And how long short-term or long-term orientation and organizational loyalty, I could have skipped it, it's do you really own organization and should you really work for an organization if it's not in your best interest? Okay, you probably have heard about high low context culture, and I'm not again going to look at that. That's high context culture. That's the context is important. What is said is more important. It is not so important than how it is said. Who wasn't there? And it's normally said that Europe in general is low context. Culture, which is not exactly true because there is different situation. The issue is that in Europe, quite often you can interact with low context. You don't need to understand the background, have a long history with people to do business with them. Quite often you don't even need to share their language. Yes, everything is very formalized. And again, that's as you move from north to south and from west to east, it's become much more high context and much more, much more important to understand what is going on. Okay, uh, I, I see I'm a bit running out of time, so I will just point a few things that different researchers, Shay, Trump, and Arthur, Adler, and Hofstad, look at cultural issue and how they look at that, and just basically look at the classic things, Gluckner and Stoltenberg, that's the way of human nature, normally do you consider people good, evil, or mixed, and again, normally you will see in Europe, as you move from north to south and from west to east, it's moved from people being mostly evil to most quite the opposite. Good in the north, more evil in the south. That's nature, and even in harmony with nature, is more promoted in the north, like Scandinavian society, Germany, and less so in the south if we look at Greece, Italy, Spain. Time orientation and mostly focus on future. For example, Finnish language doesn't have future tense because everything that is planned for future should be happening now. So it's so future oriented, it does not even have future. Why, if you think of Spain, France, uh, Greece, it's very much built on history and it's defined it as historical presence. Activity, what people should be, or what they should do, or sh they should be in becoming. And again, if we look at Nordic society, they're more becoming. There is a lot of focus on education, continuing.
continue education change and so on why in more latin society france spain we would see what people should be so the history is important education is important but as it's yet status why in the middle in germanic society germany czech republic there switzerland what people do what is the basically outcome of their action and again space private or public there are much more public space in the north and very few private spaces as i told you even your home is not your private home because morally and actually legally you are obliged to let people in if they are in distress why in spain in france and Greece, you will see a lot of private space people have a lot of swan walls and there is a, even private parks and so on okay so again i'm going to go over that and uh, since this explains that and just wanted to talk about Hofstad dimension as you know as i mentioned it was the first research and it's continuous 66 nations and there were a lot of questions it wasn't started but now i would like to share a different screen with you if i can see okay okay so uh this is hofstad website that i put different cultural dimensions here and as you can see I put Finland, Spain but also India and in some areas you can see that India would be closer to Spain than to Finland that's just to demonstrate that there is a lot of diversity and there is no universal cultural value. Power distance for example how important are the power and do the less powerful members of the society believe that there should be separation of power power distance is very large in india probably not a surprise to you rather small in finland but spain is closer to india than to finland just a second even though the difference wouldn't be significant still on power distance people from spain will understand i mean people who share culture indians managers better than finnish managers individualism is again higher in finland but not that high it's in the middle and individualism in india and space quite basically the same there is no significant difference they're basically middle of the road not very collectivistic societies but not obviously individualistic masculinity is higher in india which is talks about gender roles or belief what's more important in life material success or relationship uh, but again it's not that far from spain and spain has bigger difference with finland which is highly feminine society meeting that people believe that quality of time being in sauna spending time and their loved one is much more important and as dr sins pointed out women are quite often in position of power so that's we have in finland there is the whole government that's it's all minister i finished uncertainty avoidance very high in spain people like to know what's happened they have a lot of rules but not necessarily follow them and it's high it's kind of high in finland but again the difference between india and finland is less than between finland and spain long-term orientation pretty much the same which is not very long-term oriented normally this dimension comes in connection with asian countries like china japan so the confucian countries and indulgence 
rather low in India. People prefer to work there, which is not actually the stereotype over here, and rather high in Finland. People like good things in life. So if we use different countries and you are welcome to play with that as have set stead and sides and compare countries you will see the differences between countries are very high you would not see the same differences for example if i use latin american countries they're different but pretty uniform or if i use a middle eastern countries so only spain has or i'm sorry only europe has that much difference and okay i am not going to go through that i just wanted to go to the last slide and then i will be happy to take your questions about project globe which i am working with right now that's india is on project globe but uzbekistan is not it looks at different leadership practices in addition to the hubs that they mentioned there is humane as a orientation assertiveness gender future orientation and performance orientation and they are quite different in european countries as well so i think right now i got under an hour and i think that would be best if i take the questions if i have any so who is going to shall i read questions or you're going to talk no, no. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your very exciting and nice lecture. And uh, now I will request Professor L. S. Sharma, sir, uh, to handle the questions. He will moderate the questions, ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. There are a couple of questions that we want to take on, uh, but first of all, I think we can switch off the slides. Okay, definitely. I just thought maybe somebody will refer to slides, but okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, certainly. Uh, there are a couple of questions that has come in through, uh, but first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for a wonderful presentation. And it has been a very mind opening and there are a lot of questions which are related with the presentation also. So let me take up one of the questions, uh, which is uh, actually related with this. Uh, this is a general question which has come in from Dr. Saad bin Hamid from Patliputra University from Bihar, from the state of Bihar in India. Uh, he has asked, what is your opinion about the cultural impact of the COVID-19? Well, as I said, that's a very good question. Thank you. That I mentioned it briefly, but basically I'm very interested in this factor and I'm looking at that kind of doing research. I think that it's interesting that it's the same challenge for all cultures, all countries, and different countries find different solutions the solution that's in line with their cultures and more or less results are basically the same so it's just more or less that no matter what solutions the countries find somehow they work with it sometimes it's good sometimes it's not good but it tells us that even in a such uniform thing i mean it's a biological thing it's not cultural that's cultural decisions are the best. So well, the example of Sweden is extreme that they decided to allow their citizen to decide for themselves. But if we compare the results, it's not drastically different from Finland who are their neighbors, which basically closed the schools, closed the economy. And it might be very interesting that the first thing Finland has opened was libraries so it's it's maybe not the best but it was the most important libraries and then gyms that's what people need not restaurants restaurants i'm not sure i think they're still closed mostly so i think that shows that cultures 
solve problems even that uh, differently, even if they look uniformly. Okay. Like, for example, I think uh, even in Japan also, they had a different viewpoint of uh, uh, dealing with the COVID-19 also. Yes, definitely. So I think any solution should be culturally sensitive. And if it's not, then it's not going to work. It's besides the topic of our discussion. But if you take United States, that there is, was a lot of kind of pullback when there was suggestion that people should wear masks because they're highly individualistic. And they might be wearing masks if nobody told them. But if somebody tells them to wear a mask, then they don't. So that's if probably the more culturally sensitive solution would be please do wear a mask because it's good for you. But so any solution that is not culturally sensitive is going to be going to backfire. Okay, thank you very much. So and I'll just pick up the second question. The second question is a little bit related with research also. Uh, so the question has come from one of our, my colleagues, uh, Professor Shantani Kumar Ghosh. And uh, the question is, the question says that uh, they are interested in the small industries and the impact of culture uh, on their behavior, particularly in respect of sustainability practices. So the, there are two parts on this question. The first part is the small industries and the impact of culture. Uh, in terms of sustain sustainability. The second part of the question is that, uh, is it possible to use the Hofstede's uh, uh, structural dimension in terms of country specific to analyze the sustainability uh, practices among the several nations which are in the United Nations? So th there are two parts in this question. The first part is on the small industries and uh, impact of culture in terms of sustainability. Second is the application of Hofstra's uh, uh, structural dimension. Well, um, thank you. They're both good questions. And again, there is also one of my area of interest. Uh, yes, definitely. I think that sustainability is important part that um, you can see the interest of that based on cultural dimension. So the countries that are concerned with nation, well, sorry, nation, nature, <laughs> sorry, that's more feminine countries. So the countries where people are in tune with the environment would be more interested in sustainability. So more feminine countries, the countries where success and short-term orientation are strong would be less interested in sustainability. It's something like, you know, get me my money now and tomorrow we all die. So again, using an example of Finland, sorry, it suggests, I think, very unusual country. So it's a good example. People spend time on vacation. I was invited by my friend and he said, Natalie, come over. We will have such fun time. We will sit and stare into darkness. Really, that's exactly what he said. So that's that's the way people spend their free time. They look into the darkness of the night and they feel calm and at peace and one with nat uh, nature. So obviously they will preserve nature, not because it's good for them, but because it's their home and their part. In the other in other places when people are not really concerned, that's unlikely to happen. Um, go into the Hofstede, Hofstede can be used, but the other, I think, dimension, which I didn't get time to look at, for example, attitude to na nature, attitude to success. So Hofstede look mostly on organizational practices, less so on the development of na uh, human and na nature. So I think more collectivistic countries are less likely generally to be concerned with general sustainability again because they look more on the in-group practices and you know ocean jungles desert they will take care of themselves who cares yeah. i think uh, there is also a well-known hygge culture in finland and denmark i believe 
and that also helps in bringing out the kind of sustainability uh, um, the next question ma'am i would like to go on is uh, uh, when we talk about uh, european union we we cannot leave out brexit so my question is related a little bit to the brexit also uh, what uh, would be the consequences of brexit on uk's trading especially in the service sector well, it's a bit outside my area of competence, so it's more the politics. But just going back to cultural issue, I would say that UK never belonged to Europe. So oh. they never really said, they used to say that I'm going to Europe if they cross the channel. And culturally, as again I mentioned, they're quite distinctly different. Their laws, their um, basically social contracts are not consistent with the rest of the Europe. So I think at the beginning it was ill-conceived marriage. So that was not really in the culturally in the best interest. I would not talk politically or economically, but it's like, you know, chalk and cheese. They look the same, but they're quite different. And the service sector, I think they will develop service sector. I have Really, I know there is a lot of kind of belly aching about Brexit, but I'm sure that it's they worked before. I'm sure they will work again. There would not be a disaster that somehow they develop contract and work together. It just again following marriage kind of allegory. They will divorce by stay friends. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh... Uh, anyway, ma'am, I think I'll just take up the last question for this session. Uh, the last question is more related with the happening of yesterday. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Chancellor Germany Chancellor Angela Merkel had taken over the rotating presidency of uh, European Union just uh, two days, or I mean, I think it was yesterday only. So, what could we expect? Uh, in this procedure, especially uh, what we're going to expect in the, the impact of this COVID-19, as well as there's going to be a, res a resultant recession in the future also. So what kind of strategies you might adopt regarding well, the European Union? Thank you. Uh, again, I will look at that from cultural perspective more. I, I want to make sure I'm not a political scientist. So <laughs> I'm management and polit not political sciences. But, you know, I would assume looking at the past action and again on cultural issues, that's that will be more scientific, more rational, more based on testing data, less so on kind of free willing so I would imagine that there would be more things counted, more testing promoted, more rules and regulations suggested. But on the other hand, you know, in rotating presidency, the president does not have that much power. So they can promote policies, they can suggest that they cannot require everybody to do anything. It's not like, you know, a president of Russia or Belarus who can say what to do and it happens next. I mean, even here in Uzbekistan, we have rather authoritarian government. So when they tell you to wear a mask, if you don't, you get fined. So that's, that's how it's done. It cannot be done in Europe. It has to be done through collaboration, discussion, democratic buy-in. So I would say, but my expectation is that it would be more to scientific testing, more to the data-driven decision-making. Maybe more or less it may follow the, 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 the strategy which Germany has already... Yes, uh, definitely. Played. So anyway, uh, thank you, ma'am, very much for this wonderful session of uh, Q&A. And I think we got into a lot of insights into this. And once again, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. And thank you again for inviting yes. me. Yes, thanks, Professor Sarma. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. K. Lal Rumoya, Assistant Professor, Department of Management, to give a formal vote of thanks.
Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, as we come to the end of this uh, informative uh, today's webinar session, uh, it is a proud privilege for me to propose a word of thanks. The organizing uh, secretaries would like to express our deepest gratitude to our respected uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, K.R.S. Sambasiva Rao, who is the main architect uh, to organize all these kind of uh, webinars. And uh, we are deeply uh, happy, we, the secretaries, are deeply happy uh, to Professor Natali. Uh, within a short span of time, she delivered an insightful uh, thought about cross culture management. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we are looking forward to interact with you again, ma'am. And we also would like to thank all the participants. Today, I would like to share that uh, we have more than 1,000 uh, registered uh, participants. So that is a huge number. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you to the participant. Last not but the least, uh, we would like to thank the ICT staff and our two uh, uh, organizing secretaries. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, have a nice day, ma'am. Thank you so much again for inviting me. It was my pleasure. I hope we stay in touch. And good luck to all the registered participants in their exams and future research career. Thanks. Thanks so much, ma'am. We will go uh, for further collaboration and other studies. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I would like to uh, invite Vice Chancellor, sir. He wants to say something. No, no, I, uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, we, we, uh, lecture is excellent. Uh, I, because I've been listening all through. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks sir, for your blessings. Yes. बंद कर दिया। हम्म? कहाँ? इंट